Look at this club. Oh, this, right. this is the second oldest church building in Pocklington. Uh, anyone want to have a guess how old it is? Uh, 1835. No, 1807 it was built. So that's 215 years old. That's older than Tom. Um, so as Phil says, there's always going to be something. It's getting old. I'm beginning to understand what that phrase means. Uh, but it's getting getting old, and we need to look after it. Does. It served us very, very well, and, uh, and, and we, we appreciate Phil, he served us very, very well as well, and um, uh, his, his heart is uh, to see God exalted in this town, and we want to continue to work in that direction. Uh, thank you to the um, helpers this morning, they, they, uh, they did a good job. That's the final scripture that I'm going to be looking at. My message. I've got three main scriptures. I'm just going to go through them. I've got loads of time, so I don't need to speed up, and I can try and keep as close to the mic as I can because it's the power. <laughs> the power goes up. You can't see what I'm, I'm saying. Um, I, I became fascinated some years ago when I heard uh, someone just chatting, and they they, they were saying that there are there are. I can't remember how the phrase was, hidden themes within John's Gospel. I thought, well, that sounds exciting. And, uh, and I said, well, what do you mean? What does that mean? So I just began to point out that there, are, uh, that there were rabbis that went back before Jesus' time, and they worked hard at what would have to happen for somebody to be confirmed as the Messiah. And, and these rabbis worked very, very hard at it. And, uh, and there were certain things that the Messiah would do that hadn't been done before. And if, all of, if somebody came and performed all of these seven things, there, there can be no doubt about the fact that they are the Messiah. And I thought, that's really, really interesting. And when I began to read, I began to see one or two little pointers. I'm not sure which of the seven stories are exactly the right ones, but I want to look at three of them this morning, one, two, and three. One and two, quite briefly, three was the one that we had read to us. And I believe that the Lord has a message for us this morning to challenge us, in addition to the challenge that's already uh, gone out. So I'm going to read from uh, Ma- uh, Matthew. I'm going to tell you a lot, John, in Matthew's Gospel. Uh, in uh, John's Gospel, and the first miracle that had never been done before the first event just take it out of the shiny thing because i can read it on the third day a wedding took place in cana of galilee so you straight away you know what the, the story is going to be but i want to read it to you jesus mother was there and jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he tells you, what well, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from eighty to 120 litres. That's a lot of water. Jesus said to the servant, fill the jars with water. So he filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. Now the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He didn't realise where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. I was shocked. <laughs> I was shocked. When you read the Bible slowly and carefully, sometimes things stand out that you didn't think. Let me read it again in case you fall asleep at that point. 
Everyone brings the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. Where do we stand on this one? <laughs> That's just been where, where it goes. But you have saved the best till now. The point being, being made, is that this is the best wine that's ever been drunk in Israel or even the world. It's the most special wine. And it's symbolic of what God wants to pour into our lives, what he wants to put into us. And if we want to know what that really means, then we put it alongside other scriptures, which will put this into place. That we shouldn't drink too much, and we certainly shouldn't drink some drink, and we certainly shouldn't get drunk. Okay? So, don't say, Alan said we say the best to the last. <laughs> this is the last, it's the best, so I want to drink it. That is not a legitimate <laughs> theological excuse. You need to show an example to those around you in your moderation and as you live your lives, as we live our lives, it needs to be seen. What Jesus did here in Canaan of Galilee, and this is the interesting thing, really. what Jesus did here in, in, in Canaan of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. This is the first sign of those seven signs. That something that had never been done before, that Jesus turned water into wine. I don't think that there's ever been any wine that didn't come through water. Yeah, because the, the vines do a transforming thing. They, they change water into grapes. And then people just deal with the grapes and produce wine. And so what Jesus did was that he, 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 he moved things around in a way that was unique. There were no vines involved, except for the one vine. And Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Or if you're from the West Indies, or India, I am the wine, the vine, and you are the branches. I realise it's croaky, I didn't realise it was that croaky. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. You only got a small glass. Didn't want to see it croaky. Okay, if that turns red, I'm taking it home with me. <laughs> this shows the creative power of Jesus. But Jesus is Lord. He can, he can do things that we can't do, simply because he's in touch with the Father. He listens to what the Father says, he hears what the Father says, and he does what the Father says. And that's what we should be doing. We should be listening to what he's saying. Not just listening to Alan preaching, or John preaching, or somebody else preaching, but what the Lord is saying through the Scriptures. And we need to discern that. If God's speaking to us personally, that's what it is. It's a personal word by the Holy Spirit to us. If God wants us to speak to the wider congregation, then we need to be sure that what he's saying isn't just uh, what, we're, what we're saying is in line with scripture and is inspired by God giving us that word to give out. And we need to discern those things to understand where God is coming from. In John chapter 1, it tells us about Jesus. It says, in the beginning was the Word. Jesus is the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. The person who created everything can easily turn water into wine. It's easily within his ability. He created the universe. So he can do things and drop them into our lives. He can bless us in ways that we wouldn't understand. Jesus is the Lord of human nature, he can change people. He says in Revelation, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to eat with that person and they with me. He wants to spend time with you. He's knocking at the door. Knocking at the door. 
Are you going to open that door? Are you going to listen to what he says? Are you going to believe? Are you going to live it out? That's what this is all about. Not looking good or understanding everything. It's about knowing Jesus and, and following him in every direction. So the first sign is the water into wine. I want to jump forward a couple of chapters now to John chapter 4. And it's the official son. Just read it again from the scripture. Interestingly, where did the water to wine take place? Yeah. It tells us that in this next one. They are linked together. It says this in John 4 verse 46. Once more he visited Cana of Galilee. I never noticed that until I started going through this. Interesting, when you see the, the, the links. Once more he visited Cana of Galilee, where he turned the water into wine. So it's not just he's it's, it's going to there again, but he's going to the place where he'd done this miracle. Jesus will always take us back to the place where we loved him. He'll always bless us and, 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 and fill us and encourage us and, and, and remind us of what he's done so that we can make room for what he has uh, to give to us. There was a certain royal official whose son lay ill at Capernaum. How far is it from Cana to Capernaum? Anybody want to tell me? You're good with numbers, Peter. Do you want to have a guess? No. <laughs> Anybody want to go? 20, 25 miles. 25 miles. So, if, 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 if we know that, this it becomes even more interesting. So, now that we know that from Cana to Capernaum, I'll just start that again. Once more, he visited Cana of Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine, and there was a certain official whose son lay ill in Capernaum. Uh, when this man heard that Jesus had a, uh, arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son who was close to death. So this guy has heard that Jesus is 25 miles away and he's gone there. Now, 25 miles, 20 minutes, or 10 if you fill. Um, <laughs> that, that was the old reputation. The new film, the new film is more careful. But he, he travelled 25 miles, whether he ran, whether he walked, whether he was on the back of a horse, whether he had a chariot. He was, he, he was a man of position, so he, he would probably have the, the latest GT chariot available. <laughs> but, but for whatever reason, he went there and he got to where Jesus was. And if we find that Jesus is 25 miles away, we need to go 25 miles and get to him. He needs to be the person that we're always coming to. Verse 48 says, unless the people, uh, unless you people see a sign, uh, Jesus told, said to him, you will never believe. The royal official said, sir, come down before my child dies. He's saying to him, come to my house, Jesus. Come. I know that if you're there, you lay your hands on You see that so often through the New Testament, but this is, this is showing it to us. He's saying, come with me to my home. You can heal my son. Do it. Please do it. Verse 50, Jesus says, go. Gee, uh, your son is, and uh, your son will live. Jesus said, go. Your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. He's travelled 25 miles. He said, please come back with me to heal my son. He's begged him. And Jesus has said, no, no, just, just go. He says, but you need to believe. And the man believed. He took Jesus at his word. And he went. <clears throat> While he was still on his way, his servants met him with the news that this, this boy was living. When he inquired as to the time, that the, the son got better. They said to him, yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. He might be 25 miles away, but he isn't like that man. He doesn't have to travel 25 miles to heal his son. He just says the word. And at the very point where he says that, the, 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 the guy's he's followed it up, he's checked it. And it, and it was... It was at that very time that his son was healed. Your son will live. So he and the whole 
household believed. This was the second sign Jesus performed. That's what it says. This was the second sign that Jesus performed. The healing power that Jesus had was not limited by a geographical situation. It was through the power of the Holy Spirit. He began to understand this. I believe that Jesus had to grow into his understanding. I don't think it, it was a magic trick and he, uh, and he suddenly knew all the answers to the exam papers. You, you, I don't care how hard you work. If you don't do the, the work, you're not going to pass the exam. You might pray and pray and pray, but you need to do the work. And we need to understand when well, we need to get the work done, when well, we need to do it. We're going to, we're going to have to pray that God will supply us with £30,000. If we all pray hard, will the £30,000 appear? I think if we put our hands in our pockets, it will begin to appear, and that will then release the blessing of God, because he wants to see faith in our lives. He wants to see us stepping out. He wants to see us believing and trusting in him. So which, that brings us to the, the, the third scripture, which we had acted out for us superbly by those wonderful actors who have been practicing this for, oh, how long have you been practicing it for? Oh, uh, <laughs> since Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> but they've not seen each other since Wednesday until this morning either, so, so there we go. But it was excellent. Thank you very much. Isn't it interesting how things like that can bring scripture to life? And you begin to see the Pharisees shaking their hands at him. <laughs> and, the, and the emotion and the things rolling up the mat. It wasn't me, you know, the, the man that healed me said that. But it's all it's all there. I'm not going to read, read through it again. But except to point out one or two things. 38 years this man had suffered. 38 years. So long long time. I know men who will get less than that for bread. 38 years. Like a big long sentence. I believe he had friends who would come and put him at the side of the pool. That's it. He inferred. But he couldn't by himself get into the water quick enough. What was necessary couldn't happen. And there are many times that we look at our lives we know what's necessary, but we don't believe that it can happen. We haven't got the faith to believe that that could, that could occur to us. It may be because we feel, and I believe a lot of it is, it's because we feel unworthy. Why would God want to bother with me? But the whole message of the good news is based on the fact that he is bothered with you. That you are important. That he died for you. That he lives for you. That he wants to bless you. You are the one that he loves. You are the apple of his eye. You, he has planned and purposed the blessing of God in your life. And all you need to do is get up and go and, go and find it. Go on. That's what I have to do. We need to follow his direction, what he's doing. For 38 years, this guy had suffered. We, 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 we all struggle. Because of that liar, that devil who whispers, you're not good enough. He whispers, you're a fraud. He whispers, that's you and me. We're the same. We're not good. We're not good. There's a, one of the hymns written by John or Charles Wesley. It has a brilliant line, which I think captures this. He said, he breaks the power of cancelled sin. He sets the prisoner free. He breaks the power of cancelled sin. What's cancelled sin? It's when the devil comes and he says, this is what Alan Slavin has done. These are all the lies and I've got all the bags full of them down here. He's not fit to come into heaven. And the father says, is that right? Oh, I said, no, talk to Jesus, talk to your son. And Jesus said, no, I know Alan. I love Alan. He does all sorts of things wrong. But he really tries his best most of the time. He talks about football too much. But yeah, I, I know Alan. I know Alan. He says, so the father says, cancel. Cancel. 
The devil comes up and he says, I'll end your life. I'll end your life. You know, and you, you think, I suppose I am because I can't think of anything to say that would be acceptable. So I'm not going to say it. All the thoughts are coming in here now. It's a spiritual warfare going on. So you know what I mean. He breaks the power of cancelled sin. So get up and get hold of something that you feel guilty about. Something that you've done in your life. You didn't want to do it. You're not proud of it. It's, it's there. You've brought it to God and you've given it to him. But still, still it haunts you. Still, it stops you from trusting because if you trust, you mean you're vulnerable and you don't want to feel vulnerable because that's when people can really hurt you and it's hard to get over it. And, 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 and life gets so, so difficult. And the power of cancelled sin is that we know that it's still there. If I were to, to I mean, some, some things that we can do wrong, we can put right. If I steal a hundred pounds off Peter. I don't have any. <laughs> I don't think it's in my pocket, that's why. <laughs> I can give it back with a bit of interest. I said, Peter, I'm so sorry, Peter, please forgive me. He says, Oh, we can't wait to see the elves with this one. No, 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 he doesn't. He says, Alan, Alan is a gift. But you can put those things right. But there are other things that can't be put right. If you do, uh, 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 it's, it, uh, again, you burn somebody's house down. Oh, I don't know where that one came from. Uh, if anybody's done that, the Lord is calling you to repent. <laughs> but, but you do that, and, and it's beyond anything that we can do to put it right. And we realise, and we think, no, it's, it's not been dealt with. It has. It has. It has been dealt with. It doesn't matter what it is. Anybody heard of David Pawson? Mm -hmm. yes. he, he was a riot around a long time ago. You could probably get CDs or things of David. I remember him coming to York and he was um, speaking at a church. <coughs> and and uh, he, he'd done some, um, some um, what's, the, what's the word? I knew this with it. So, so when, you, when you try and find out information. Research, research. research, research. <laughs> so does research. He does some research and um, and he, he, he looked into all the Nazi leadership. Hitler, Goering, all, all of them. Uh, especially the ones who survived up to the trial. And there was, uh, it was a bigger number than I realised, probably about 20 people who were um, found guilty of, of crimes and sentenced to death. And they, they, they were executed. But he, he said that there's evidence, solid evidence, that a handful of them at least made a commitment to Christ before they were executed. Their sin was cancelled. You know, not as bad as that. And the Austin has been cancelled too. It's hard to believe, but the grace of God is that deep that it is hard to believe. The goodness of God is so magnificent that we sometimes feel that we can't believe. But he loves you. He loves me. He is the restorer of power. He can give us back what our cancelled sin has heaped upon us. He can bring us back to that place and uh, where we can stand up proud of him, not of what we've achieved. To this guy who had been there 38 years, Jesus said three things. He said, rise. He was telling him to do what he can't do. He's been a cripple for 38 years. Do you want to get well? I can't get down to the water quick enough. Rise. Rise. And he stood up. <laughs> he stood up. Isn't that amazing? He stood up. He heard what Jesus said and he did it. He caused a miracle. He could have sat there and argued black's white. 
Oh, I can't, I can't do that. I've got enough pain as it is. If I try to stand up on these legs, it'd snap. And that, that'll, be, that'll be agony to me. Jesus is saying, rise up. Stand. Do the thing you can't do. Take up your mat. Why, why does he say take up your mat? It's gone, look. Why does he say take up your mat? Because he's saying make no provision for a relapse. You've been healed. That healing is going to take you through to eternity. That blessing in your life is not going to be taken away. The blessing of God is, is there forever. Make no provision for a relapse. Take your mat out of here. You're not coming back here. Just go on. Get out while you can. Go on. Go on. <laughs> says, rise. Take up your mat and walk. Why does he say, I walk? He's saying it because he's used to being carried everywhere. And he's saying, nobody's going to carry you now. You've got to stand on your own two feet, literally. You're going to have to go and get out. You're going to have to go and, and, and make the effort to enter into all the blessing that I have for you. The paralyzed man acted at once on the faith that had come to him in Jesus. He acted. He stood up. He rolled up his mat and he walked. The guy didn't even know who Jesus was. But he's spoken to him. There are people around the world and, and they don't hear the name of Jesus. But if they just, for some reason, get a revelation, call out the connections there. But what happened when Jesus went up and caught him? He says, make sure you don't go and get crippled again. No, don't sin again. Don't quite understand that bit. But he's had everything cancelled. So he's saying, don't get tricked. Don't get tricked up. Serve me. Enjoy the blessing of God. Amen.